How many of you are looking forward to hearing about Jabez, Jabez this morning? Anybody? Well, you're not going to hear about him. We were preaching out of Nehemiah today. I was putting the sermon together and uh, this, this week and it just, it just wasn't happening. And generally when that happens, I know that God wants me to go in another direction. So I said, okay, God, if you don't want me to talk about Jabez, and who do you want me to talk about? And We're talking about for such a time as this, a moment in life or moments in life where, where God gets a hold of you and says, I need you and I want you and this is your job. And uh, God said, I want you to preach about Nehemiah. I said, okay, well, that fits into the ser- ser- sermon series. We can go with that. So if you have your Bible today, open up to Nehemiah chapter 1. There you go, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Let's stand together as we read God's Word. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Amen. You may be seated. See, that's our first problem with for such a time as this. When we pray to the God of heaven, that's what gets us in trouble. Right there. When we ask God, God, what should I do? Where should I go? How can I help? He will find a place, and He will find a purpose, and He will find a way for you. No questions asked. Now, even if you don't ask, God still has a way and a purpose and a plan for you. But what we find happening in Nehemiah in chapter 1 is, is that um, he, is, he is saddened by, by the situation in Jerusalem. The king of Persia is, is quite a tolerant king. He has allowed some people to go back to Judah and to go back to Jerusalem we put our time frame together, Ezra's probably already back. He's, he's working on rebuilding or refurbishing the temple, try to get temple practices going again, which is all right with the king of Persia. Now, Nehemiah is a cupbearer of the king. He's, he's very important to the king, and, and, and in a hierarchy, he's, he's well up in the king's cabinet. So he has a a lot of impact and influence on the king, and and the king cares for him greatly. Now, we don't know if Nehemiah had ever been to Jerusalem or Judah. Most likely a child in the exile, okay, which means he grew up, born and grew up in Persia. But his heart was for home. His heart was for Israel. He had heard the stories. He he had read the scriptures. He, he, He knew that God loved his people and that God would redeem his people at just the right time. Now, he was sort of in a conundrum. He heard from his brother who had been back to Judah and Jerusalem and found out that things were a mess there. Okay? People who had been resettled in the land, 
were taking advantage of the Israelites who were there and who were moving back to the land. They didn't want them coming back. They had grown comfortable in this new place. This is a nice place. Good soil, good crops, good houses. If all of those Israelites, all of those Jews come home, they're going to outnumber us. And we won't have any impact. We won't have any influence. We won't have any say anymore. So they kept badgering those in Jerusalem. They kept taking advantage of those who had gone back. So what was Nehemiah to do? He had a really good job in the court of the king. Probably had a nice house in Susa and good salary. Well respected. Well, maybe he should just abandon his hope for the homeland. Maybe he should let somebody else worry about that. Maybe he should just try to forget about it. You know, I've never been there. They tell me it's nice. They tell me the temple was a beautiful thing. They tell me Jerusalem was an awesome city. I've never been here. I'm I'm growing up in this palace, in this citadel, with this king. Maybe I should just abandon my hope for the homeland. Maybe he was going to question God's plan for Jerusalem. Well, maybe, maybe God means for it to be destroyed. Maybe God doesn't want it to be back. Maybe, maybe God, maybe it's not time for us to go home yet. Maybe God just doesn't get it. Or was he willing to let God use him for such a time as this? Now, we say he was in the king's court. He was looked on uh, with favor by the king. But he wasn't anything special. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't wealthy of his own devices. He didn't own a lot of land. As far as we know, he he isn't in the lineage of of any of the priests or the Levites. Okay? His heritage even in Jerusalem is, is probably not of the upper crust. But what did he do when he heard? He prayed. He prayed. And by praying, he was willing to let God use him however God wanted to. God, if you want me to stay here in the palace of the king and be his cupbearer, I will do that. If you want me to go back to Jerusalem and to help rebuild the city and, and re-strengthen its defenses and, and teach the people what it means to follow you, I will do that. If it means being a voice here in Persia before, before all of the Jews that, that live here and before all of the nations that live here, I will do that. But he began to really desire to go. That desire to go just began to grow in him and grow in him and grow in him. And he was going to ask for the impossible. We'll get to that impossible in a moment. But see, when you're asking for the impossible, you have to ask the question first, how big is your God? And is your impossible impossible to him? Remember, Nehemiah's in a in a pretty good place in Persia. He's not lacking, his family's not lacking. Well respected, well cared for. How big is your God? Let's let's look and see what the scripture says about God. Exodus 15, verse 11. Who among the gods is like you, Lord, 
Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Who is like God? Verse 12 says, You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. There are actually stories in the Old Testament where the earth opened up and swallowed people. Well, yeah, that was probably just a fault line and a little bit of earthquake and some people tripped and fell. Or maybe God just opened up the earth because He's God and He can. What gods are like you, God? Verse 13 says, In your unfailing love you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. I wonder if Nehemiah wasn't familiar with this verse. Because that's exactly what he is praying about in verse 13. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. We already know that there's a a remnant in Jerusalem trying to get the temple back in shape. But what good is the temple if the city lies in ruins and the walls are broken down and the gates are burned? Ezra is, I mean, Nehemiah is developing this, this passion to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the wall. See, but that's the impossible. Number one, because although he is the cupbearer to the king, and although he is well respected in the court, he is nothing more than a slave. He is not a free man. He belongs to the king of Persia. He is the king's servant. He just can't go up to the king and say, Hey, yeah, I'm taking some vacation time. I'm going to Jerusalem for the holiday. He just can't up and quit. The cupbearer does not quit the service of the king. The penalty for that is death. So he's envisioning the impossible. Leaving the service of the king and going back to Jerusalem. How big is his God? Was he familiar with Exodus Fifteen, thirteen. In your unfailing love you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength you will guide them to your holy dwelling. Back to 11. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? That sounds like a big God to me. And it's going to take a big God to do the impossible. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Let's look at verses 21 and 22. When we ask ourselves, how big is our God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He, God... Sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Growing up uh, in the South, as a child, we had red ants, fire ants. Those of you who have been to Lake Providence have experienced them. Okay. One of the things I love to do is I love to disturb their ant pile because they all came out. And then I love to act like Godzilla and stomp through the ant pile, killing as many red ants as I could kill. That's sort of the image we have of God here. He is so big and majestic that He looks down from heaven and we appear as grasshoppers or fire ants before Him. That's a pretty big God. 
That's an amazing mental picture. Now the sad thing is, as I stomped through the red ants, never learning my lesson, they sort of knew how to hang on and start to climb on your feet and climb up your legs. And soon I was stomping my way away from the ant pile to the hose to try to get them off because they hurt. Thank goodness God doesn't stomp across the earth smashing us like grasshoppers under His feet. But that's how big He is in Isaiah chapter 40. Let's look at verse 25 and 26, the same chapter in Isaiah. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. This talks about the Creator God, the God who, who with His hands spun out the universe and knows every star and every planet and every supernova and every black hole that's out there. How big is your God? Is your God the Creator God? Is your God so big that as He looks down we appear as grasshoppers before Him? Is your God majestic? And filled with glory. Psalm 139. Such a beautiful psalm when when you talk about God and and what He knows and what He's capable of. We're going to look at a couple different sections. Verses 1 through 4 to begin with. Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. That is a God that knows you better than you know yourself. A God who is concerned about you individually. Not just a horde of grasshoppers scooting across the landscape. But each individual grasshopper is unique to him and special. You are unique and special to the God of God and the Lord of Lords. How big is your God? Verses 7 through 10, the same psalm. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. The times of the Greeks and Roman gods, if you wanted to go worship one of those gods, you had to go to their temple. But this is talking about a God that is everywhere. There is nowhere you can go and not be in His presence. There is nowhere on the face of this earth that you can hide yourself from Him. That's how big God is. And that's how big Jeremiah believed his God was. Remember, he's asking God for the impossible. Is your God big enough to do the impossible with you? Verses 13 through 16, same psalm. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth... Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. 
an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God, and an all-present God. That's the kind of God I believe Nehemiah believed he had. That brings us to chapter 2 of Nehemiah, verses 1 through 5. So Nehemiah 2, 1 through 5. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, When wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sat in his presence before. Why? Because it was against the law to be sat in the presence of the king. You weren't allowed to be sat in the presence of the king unless he told you to be sat. If he said, Barbara, be sad, Barbara had to be sad. (laughs) He didn't want his cupbearer sad. His cupbearer was to ensure that there was no poison in the drink, to ensure that that wine came from a secure vat of wine, safe for the king to drink. He didn't want anybody distracted bringing him his wine. But here we find Nehemiah distracted and saddened. He says, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? If you were sick, you should have called in. But you're here. What's going on? The king, perceptive as he is, says, This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. He could tell just by looking at Nehemiah, a young man that potentially he may have known or raised from a child in his, in his castle, in his, in his citadel, in his kingdom. He knew Nehemiah. And he said, this is a big deal. Something's going on with Nehemiah. This is deeper than hurt feelings. This is deeper than having an argument with his wife on the way to work. This is deeper than him having a cold. This is something deep within his heart. I was very much afraid. Because I could be fired. I could be killed. I could make a big mistake here. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? You weren't allowed to bring anything to the king that might upset him. You weren't allowed to bring anything to the king that might cause him distress. And Nehemiah is bringing an issue that not only causes him distress, but could cause, potentially cause the king distress. And he says, Nehemiah, what do you want? In a sense, Nehemiah's just talked back to the king. And the king says, Nehemiah, what do you want? And what does Nehemiah do? It says... Now, let me find my spot. Oh, it says, Then I prayed to God in heaven. Elizabeth used a, a different word for it the other day with the kids, but I call this a prayer bullet. In the midst of this conversation with the king, the king says, What do you want? And Nehemiah says, God, help me. Before he responds. I think he knows what he wants to do, but he wants to make sure that he is on the same page as God before he responds to the king. So he sends up that prayer bullet. And then he answered the king. says, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Nehemiah asked for the impossible, but his God was big enough. 
His God was big enough to handle the impossible. God enabled him to not only accomplish, but to begin with by asking for the impossible. He and a small band of exiles who have returned to the land, rebuilt all of the broken sections of the wall, and reset the gate in 52 days, even with the opposition of the other people around them. They accomplished an impossible task because with God it is not impossible. For all things are possible through Him who gives you strength. So we, we, we got to just tag that scripture right there. All things are possible. So that poses the next question. Might God be calling you to the impossible? Might God be calling you to something that is bigger than yourself? Might God be calling you to do something you never imagined you could do? Now some of you are saying, well, John, I'm not going to the mission field. You know? This is, a, this is a missionary message? Yes, it is a missionary message. But you don't have to go to Uganda or to Sierra Leone or, or to South Philadelphia. We got some Philadelphia folks here. To be a missionary. You can be a missionary right here. And the impossible can be right in front of you right here. I don't know what your impossible is, but God does. And He wants you to go. So are you open to a for such a time as this moment in your life? You know, if you say yes, it might be Uganda. But it might be height PTA. Or it might be your neighbor who lives across the street. Or it might be a a foreign mission trip uh, to experience a new land and a new culture for two weeks next summer. See, that's between you and God. See, is your God big enough to allow you to go into all the world, whatever that world or segment of the world might be, preaching and teaching and commanding humanity to obey God's Word? Is your God big enough? The God who created the world. Is your your God big enough? The God who, who created humanity, the God who desires a relationship with His creation, are, are, is He big enough? This God who through Christ became man and dwelt among us, who gave His very life for us that we might be redeemed from our sins, is He big enough to accomplish your impossible? This God who at judgment every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that He is God, King of kings and Lord of lords. Is that God big enough? This God who loves you. I say He's big enough. to enable you, through Him, to accomplish your impossible. So, will you go? That's the question. And like so many times, I don't want to answer that until you tell me where I'm going. Okay? Oh, we don't get that choice. God simply wants to know if you'll go. To the neighbor, to the elementary school, to the inner city, to the next state, to the next country, to halfway across the world. God just wants to know if you'll go. And if you say yes, then He'll tell you where. And then you have to be willing to step out on faith and go. For a week for a month, for a year, for a lifetime. Every one of our calls is different, but every one of us has a call right now.
right now. Well, you know, I know I'm called to the mission field, but I've got to finish school first, so I don't have to do anything until I'm finished school. Nope, not true. Because there are little mission fields all along the way as you finish your education to better prepare you for that giant leap to the mission field when you're finally ready to go. Nehemiah said, I am ready for such a time as this. And God enabled the impossible to happen. And for him to go and do the impossible in Jerusalem. Remember, he didn't have a callus on his hand. Okay? He was a cupbearer in the court of the king. He had manicured nails and fancy clothes. All right? I mean, how would you feel if you're starting a building project and a guy gets out of the contractor's truck and, and uh, you know, he's got nice manicured nails and soft, silky hands and his, he's got some gel in his hair and he's got a nice Izod sweater on and some penny loafers. And he goes, I'm ready to build this. You're going to go, uh, where are the guys in overalls and jeans? Those are the guys we want building. That's, that's what Nehemiah was. He was a pretty boy from the castle who God asked to do something impossible who went to Jerusalem and put on his overalls and jeans and put a sword on his side and a spade in his hand and did something he never imagined he would do. Build something physical. God didn't call a contractor. He didn't call a heavy equipment operator to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He called the cupbearer of the king. So don't think just because you never have that you never can. Amen. Amen. The, the call and the invitation are right there. Okay? Is your God big enough? I say He is. Jesus came to earth to show you how much God loved you. He came down as God in human form to live before each of us a life that He wanted us to model ours after. said to his disciples, do like I have done. He changed the world. Three years time, he turned the entire world on its head. And he says, do like I have done. If you respond today in any way, if, if God lays something on your heart you'd like to share with the church, whatever it might be, we just have this time of invitation. You can stay sitting and praying. You can stand and sing. Whatever you like. But don't say no to God. He's big enough to take care of.